Daniel chapter 10, verse 14, and also chapter 11, verse 2. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. And the first part of 11 verse 2, And now will I show thee the truth. Who is the king of the north? This message that I'm about to share with you comes as a consequence of the message I shared last week. Whether Daniel 11 was salvational or not. And we beheld that Jesus, our Saviour, was totally involved in the... uh, vision of Daniel chapter 11. We saw that Jesus was engaged in the world politics. We saw that as we come to Daniel chapter 11 verse 45, the next event is the close of probation. And Jesus had warned the believers who study the Bible that this day of the coming of Jesus, of the close of probation, will take them as a thief. He warned them. And the scripture that uh, was directly associated with the uh, drying up or the king of the north coming to his end and none shall help him, which is directly equal to Revelation 16, the drying up of the river Euphrates, that when that takes place, there is inserted in Revelation 16 verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Is this not salvational? So important. And it was a comment by a listener to last um, week's sermon who expressed this. If this is a salvational issue, it would be wise to thoroughly study it and have the correct understanding of it. So indeed, because of such a realistic uh, expression by this person, we will spend this hour to apply ourselves to the study of it thoroughly so that we come to a correct understanding. To come to a correct understanding of any subject in the Bible, it is absolutely essential to use Bible principles to ascertain what is absolute truth. We are surrounded today by theological arguments that do not follow the Bible principle of ascertaining any subject in truth. If we come to the Bible principle that is expressed in 2 Peter chapter 1, we see a very important call upon the student of the Bible and especially of prophecy. In 2 Peter, reading there from chapter 2, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1 of 2 Peter, verse 19. And it says, We have also 
a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first. Now follow, he has just expressed how important it is that we are clearly able to see the light of prophecy, which is more sure than any other person's testimony. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when it comes to the subject of Daniel 11 and the king of the north, we have many interpretations today. But the Bible is explicit. It says the principle that we must follow is that we do not place any private interpretation upon the prophecy. That's number one. And that's what it says, knowing this first. That's number one. Because, verse, it says in chapter 2, verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who br privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction bring upon themselves swift destruction. The subject that we are studying here is a destructive subject, prophecy. And if people are under a false teaching, they will bring upon themselves swift destruction. So, no private interpretation. Therefore, how are we to read the Bible? so that we don't come up with a false interpretation. Let's go to Isaiah 34. Chapter 34 of Isaiah, verse 16. Isaiah 34, verse 16. And here it says, what are we to do? So we don't come up with our own private interpretations. Don't interpret the Bible. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded and his spirit it hath gathered them. So read, don't interpret. That's an important principle. No private interpretations. Seek the words out of the book of the Lord and read. It reads as it reads. It will not need any explanation. It will read as it reads. And very emphatically does the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6, lay this point upon our appreciation. Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Read. Take it as it reads. Don't put your private interpretation on it. It says in verse 5 of, chapter, of, of Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee. And... Thou be found a liar. The 144,000 have no guile in their mouth. They are no liars. They will present the pure truth, the pure word, without in private interpretation. They will not be found a liar because they take the pure word and add nothing to it and take nothing from it. These are imperative principles if we are going to come to the knowledge of the truth, and especially on this subject, 
of the king of the north. And here I want to read from the Spirit of Prophecy and Great Controversy, page 598, paragraph 3, where it says, um, <clears throat> That um, I just want to find the exact words here, not to spend too much time on unnecessary uh, expressions. Great Controversy 598, paragraph 3. Um, there is an um, expression here that uh, I want to pinpoint. Let me find it because it's, uh, it's a bit of a trap here with this particular language. Yes, the language of the Bible, but it's not on my screen. The screen has played tricks on me. You got it there, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, brother. Yes, the language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. Christ has given the promise, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. If men would take the Bible as it reads, if there were no false teachers to mislead and confuse their minds, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. What a profound statement. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or a figure is employed. So obvious meaning, unless a figure is employed. And I want to just really bring this point home because here in um, Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1089, in paragraph 1 it says there, Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1089, and reading there that, um, that the problem is what people do with the Bible, it says, uh, Jesus knew that he could, he could do the Jesus knew that he could do the scribes and Pharisees no good unless they would empty themselves of self-importance. And she goes on to say that uh, it is his design, it is his design that his disciples should take the plain, unadulterated truth for their guide. They were not to add to his words or give a forced meaning to his utterances. They were not to put a mystical interpretation upon the plain teaching of the scriptures and draw from theological stores to build up some man-made theory. No private interpretation, no man-made theory. It was through putting a mystical meaning upon the plain words of God that sacred and vital truths were made of little significance while the theories of men were made prominent it was in this way that men were led to teach for doctrines the commandments of men and that they rejected the commandments of God that they might keep their own tradition this is no different today as it was in the time of Christ the theologians the doctors of theology were in, in, out of harmony with Christ and with the true reading of the Bible. What did it say? It said that they placed a mystical interpretation on the plain words as they are written there. So 
the Bible must be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. So let us proceed to use these Bible principles and apply them in the reading of the Daniel chapter 11 to read its obvious meaning. The vision of Daniel chapter 11 commences in chapter 10. That's where the, the, the whole vision of Daniel 11 covers Daniel chapter 10 through to Daniel chapter 12. It's all one vision. And uh, we go there and follow carefully the addressing by the angel to Daniel. He is addressing Daniel and he is um, and Daniel was in, in a plight because all through his experience of the visions that he had, some of the visions were symbolic. The image of Daniel chapter 2, the beasts of Daniel chapter 7, and the ram and the he-goat of Daniel chapter 8, they were explained to Daniel. And as he comes to Daniel chapter 11, to his other vision, he, he was still trying to work his way through all the meanings and he was troubled. And he was yearning for guidance. And that's when, in Daniel chapter 10, the angel Gabriel comes to him. In verse 11, he says, <clears throat> He said unto me, this angel said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright for unto thee am I now sent. And when, I, when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. What was Daniel's problem? He was asking God for illumination, clarification. And so now the angel is coming to him, and notice what he, what he expresses in verse 14, which was our scripture reading. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. So the language of the angel says, I'm coming here to help you understand, to give you understanding. And he says in verse 21, but I will, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince, here's Jesus again. So he has come now to show Daniel what the scriptures of truth are saying. So notice here the angel is coming to explain and to reveal what the scriptures are saying. In, verse, in chapter 11, verse 2, notice he says in the first part there, and now I will show thee the truth. I will show thee the truth. Notice, the angel came to explain the truth in Daniel chapter 11. To remove any uh, questions in reference to the symbolisms of the prophecies in the past to unravel any symbolic confusions of the past visions. That's what he said. And now I will show thee the truth. Now just notice this for a moment because in the uh, Daniel chapter 7 where those images, those symbolic images were given, they had to be explained by the angel. And notice his language. Come to Daniel chapter 7 there, and verse 15 to 17. Daniel chapter 7, 
reading there verses 15 to 17. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. He told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now did you notice the angel turns around and says to him, I'm going to show you the truth. Like he said to Daniel in Daniel chapter 11, I'm going to show you the truth. It's not a symbol, it's the truth I'm going to show you. As I'm going to show you here in Daniel chapter 7, I'm going to show you the truth of what the symbols mean. Very important language. Daniel chapter 8. It's repeated there with another imagery. Daniel 8 verses 15, and six, uh, 15 to 19. Daniel eight fifteen to 19. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. When he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright, and he said, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. So the vision of the symbols, when they were to be explained as to what they meant, the angels repeated this many times over, I'm going to show you the truth, I'm going to give you the understanding, to unravel the symbol to the reality. This is very important Preamble, And if you come to Daniel chapter 9, verse 21 to 23, where, again, because of Daniel's problem of understanding the symbols perfectly and all the meanings of these things, the angel came in answer to his prayer in Daniel 9, verse 21 to 23, where it says, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came and came forth, and I am come to show thee for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. I'm going to show you the truth. The previous visions of Daniel chapter 11 needed explanation still. Daniel was still in perplexity. And he comes to the experience of Daniel chapter 11 and thou there the angel is explaining fully unobscured explanation, nothing obscured by any symbolic thing. It was a plain description without using symbols. That's what we are observing here with what we have read. And notice carefully what Daniel chapter 10 expressed, the angel said there, verse 14. I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for 
many days. Indeed, the vision of Daniel chapter 11 is a very lengthy description over many days. A very lengthy account of detailed historic events that were explained to Daniel in this vision. They were detailed events from the time in which Daniel was living and the unfolding of the history of these detailed events to, what is it? To show thy, what, what will befall thy people in the latter days. This is all very important preamble before we get down into it. So let's go and see what he said to Daniel in plain language, no symbolism. Daniel 11 verse 2, what does he say? And now, I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and he shall be divided toward the four and shall be divided to the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. There is the beginning of the vision. There is the experience of Daniel as he was in the kingdom of Persia. And the, the angel says to him, just without any symbolism, I'm here to show you what will happen from here onwards. The kings of Persia will continue from Cyrus through four more kings, and after, and especially that one king who will, who will stir up Grecia. He went with all his power and might, and you can go into the historic detail of this king, Xerxes, who was a great wealthy king and over five million pe people, men were in his army. And he stirred up Grecia because he went to attack Greece and, uh, and uh, Greece started to get really angry. He failed to conquer, but he stirred Grecia up. And then comes the mighty king that shall stand up in Grecia, the one king, Alexander the Great, so-called, who who conquered all the empire of Persia, and now, as he comes to his final conquering, he, under a debauchery of, of drunkenness, uh, is, dies, and in his place arise generals who take over from his kingdom, uh, take over his kingdom. It is impossible for me to engage with you over this short hour that we have in this divine service, to go through the entire detail of the many days of history that were described there. But you want to do this, and if you want to uh, examine closely, all you need to do is go through the book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, and you'll get all the detail. But the important thing that I have done here is to show that in our study, we are to read it as it reads and not to put any symbolism there. As Sister White wrote, that unless a symbol is used, it is to be taken as it reads. There are no symbols that are used in the book, in the vision of Daniel chapter 11. It is all as it is explained by the angel to him. 
So here is a summary from the spirit of prophecy that I want to read that gives us a very uh, clear appreciation of what we're studying when we're studying the book of Daniel. And um, in uh, manuscript releases, volume 12, page 390, paragraph 2 and 3. The description of the history of Daniel chapter 11 that we look back to now, but it was a prophecy for, for Daniel. It says, um, in the types and shadows that uh, were given in the prophecies there uh, were to meet the reality when the true high priest was to come into office. Each actor, each actor in history stands in his lot and place for God's great work after his own plan will be carried out by men who have prepared themselves to fill positions for good or evil. In opposition to righteousness, men become instruments of unrighteousness. By their course of action, sorry, but their course of action is unforced. They need not have become instruments of unrighteousness any more than need Cain. God said to him, If thou dost well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door. Cain would not hear the voice of God, and as a result he killed his brother. Men of all characters, righteous and unrighteous, will stand in their positions with the characters they have formed, they will act their part in the fulfillment of history. In a crisis, just at the right moment, men will stand in the places they have prepared themselves to fill. Believers and unbelievers will fall into line as witnesses to confirm truth which they do not themselves comprehend. All will cooperate in accomplishing the purposes of God as did Anus, Caiaphas, Pilate and Herod. And that's the book of Daniel chapter, that's the vision of Daniel chapter 11. Every person comes in by their own choices in their conflict with the battles between empires and they all fill their place as it says there in the... uh, uh, in the, as actors. And as you study Daniel chapter 11, you see the actors fulfilling the, their, their roles. And I found it so fascinating to actually see that Jesus is there orchestrating human beings as he did also Caiaphas and Annas and, and all those. It was by the fact that he came to earth and lived here that he orchestrated human reactions. And that's what he did all the way through Daniel chapter 11. It's a fascinating study. And and so as we come through the history, as each person fulfills his place in the history of the prophecy as an actor in in the whole drama, Sister White writes in Welfare Ministry, page 136, paragraph 2, She says, this powerful little statement, she says, the world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecies of the 11th of Daniel have almost reached their final fulfillment. They have almost reached their final fulfillment. And the pioneers of Adventism understood Daniel 11 very well and knew exactly what Sister White was writing and she knew exactly what she was writing in harmony with what they were teaching. So the book of Daniel, their history, unconfused by symbolisms, was being unfolded and cleared uh, through the descriptions there right to the very last moment of a history. So, 
What I can do in our limited time in examining Daniel chapter 11, we, we examine the beginning of the vision and the explanation so that we can then verify the end of the vision by the explanation in the beginning of the vision. So to ascertain the king of the north and the king of the south, we look at the beginning of the vision and we will arrive at the correct conclusion as to what the king of the north is and what the king of the south is at the beginning of the vision. Let's go to Daniel 11, verse 2 to 6 once again. And I've just read it to you before that after Persia, after those other kings, after Cyrus and, um, and the stirring up of the Grecian king, eventually the Grecian king, a mighty king, verse 3, shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity nor according to his dominion which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside. And the king of the south, verse 5, shall be strong and one of his princes and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion and in the end of the years they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of his arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm, but he shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. And then it goes on and on and on. And you've got to study history to see how it all unfolded. But here you can see that Alexander the Great died and his kingdom was separated according to Daniel chapter 8. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 8 and see what happened to the kingdom of Alexander when, his, when he died died. Here in Daniel chapter 8, the he-goat of Daniel chapter 8 is Grisha. That was explained by the angel. So here's the plain explanation of Grisha, of the symbol of Grisha. Uh, Daniel 8 verse 19 to 22 says, And behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indig indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time, of their kingdom when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So here we see what happened to Grisha. When Alexander died, who took over? Four generals to the four winds. The four generals that arose after Alexander was killed, after they had the conflict among themselves, was uh, uh, Seleucus, Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Cassander. And as the story goes on, because all that you see in Daniel chapter 11 is that it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south. Well, what happened was that uh, the Seleucus took the, uh, the eastern side, Ptolemy took Egypt, and Cassander and Lysimachus took the, uh, the further west 
that was where it was distributed. But among these generals, among these generals, there was war. And ultimately, Cassander and Lysimachus were conquered by Seleucus. And Ptolemy continued to keep his territory in Egypt. And that ended up with the king of the north and the king of the south. Seleucus took over the entire Asia Minor area and Egypt was, take, was kept by Ptolemy and the, and the annexed part of Egypt to himself. And then is the description between these two kings that goes on and, um, and this, from this point, from this point onwards, the angel Gabriel unfolds the history of the nations associated with north and south. North and south of where? Where was Daniel's place? Daniel's place was Palestine. And everything to do with Daniel and his people and remember it says there, I will show you what will uh, take place of your, among your people in the latter days. It is, it is the people who have got their, their place in Palestine that the kings of the north and the kings of the south are being shown and related to. So it is the territory that has, was split up among the generals of Alexander, the territory. And this is as the Bible reads, north and south of Palestine. No interpretation, no symbolism. The reality that the king of the north was Seleucus, who took over the Cassandra and Lysimachus' terrain, and that was north of Palestine, and Egypt and the annexed areas there were under Ptolemy, the king of the south. That is south from Palestine and that is north from Palestine. That was the territory. And as I repeat here, no symbols, territory. All literal Bible reading as the angel explained it. I will let... Daniel and Revelation, the writings by Uriah Smith here, just do the work for me to, um, to help us understand what we conclude as we travel through the history that is depicted in Daniel 11. Here, in, this is from Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, page 249, paragraph 3 of the 1890, 1897 edition. During the wars, the revolutions, which for long ages succeeded, these geographical boundaries were frequently changed or obliterated. Old ones were wiped out and new ones instituted. But whatever changes might occur, these first divisions of the empire must determine the names which these portions of territory should afterwards bear. Or we have no standard by which to test the application of the prophecy. Can you see the vivid, clear mentality that is here to be exercised? What standard are we going to use to interpret the rest of the description by the angel to Daniel? There is no other standard but the, but the geographical territory that is, that is being applied to. No symbolism, geographical territory, north and south. And he goes on to say, that is, whatever power, whatever power at any time should occupy the territory which at first constituted the king of the north, that power, so long as it occupied that territory, would be 
the king of the north. And whatever power should occupy that which at first constituted the king of the south, that power would so long be the king of the south. We speak only these two because they are the only ones afterwards spoken of in the prophecy and because, in fact, almost the whole of Alexander's empire finally resolved itself into these two divisions. That's the explanation that we are to, to take from the angel, north and south territory, no symbolism. The people that rule the north is the king of the north. The people that rule the south is the king of the south. So, without long detailed coverage, we arrive at Daniel chapter 11. We arrive at Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. He's, he's described all through the history, which we haven't got time to pursue, but Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, is the, what Sister White says, we are now so close to the end of that being fulfilled. Daniel 11, verse 40 says, and at, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now all true Bible students of prophecy know the date of the, of the time of the end. Do you know what that is? What's the time of the end? What's the date? 1798. What happened in 1798 by the French? The Pope was taken prisoner in February 1798 by under General Berthier, who was a general under Napoleon. So here it says, at, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him. Who is him? Who, is, who are they pressing, pushing against? It's verses 36 onwards, which is France. What happened? What did, Fran what did France do? It was trying to develop its own empire. And it, there was war between the French and the English, as we know from history. And France sent its foreign legion to Egypt. They were fascinated with Egypt. Egypt is the king of the south, yes? And what happened after 1798 in, Feb in February, in March... Napoleon took his army down to Egypt to deal with it, to conquer it, to become, to occupy it. And what does the king of the south Egypt do? He, he pushes against him at the end, at the time of the end, 1798. There was the day. And as Egypt pushed against the French, the king of the north, which was the people who ruled at that time in the north was Turkey. And it was Turkey that in all reality came and pushed against the French. And as the story goes there, the French were routed by Turkey and, uh, and Egypt being a weak place, that they were helped by the king of the north and, and, the, and the French were ousted from that territory. That was a fulfilment of prophecy to identify who the king of the south and who the king of the north was at that time. Turkey and Egypt, of course. So, as you read there from verses 40 onwards, it's talking about the king of the north. At the time of the end, the king of the north comes against him with great power in verse 41, he shall also enter into the glorious land and many countries will be overthrown, but these shall escape and so on. It goes into the detail of Turkey conquering France and then, or, or the French chasing them out of Egypt 
and he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, verse 42, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And that was a war again where the, where the king of the north, Turkey, was even dealing with Egypt there, conquering it. Verse 43, and he, the king of the north still, shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. This is where the, uh, uh, the war um, uh, from Russia and England came down upon Turkey. That's described there. So this is all the territory explained, the king of the north explained from Turkey what he was going through, verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now, just before I go any further, did you pick up In 1798, the papacy was taken captive, wasn't it? And the history continues here. Can the papacy be the king of the north, according to this? Can that be possible? According to this description, the papacy was, the pope was taken prisoner and his power was removed. The deadly wound was imposed upon the papacy and here in the time of the king of the north and the south, when at the time of the, of the last days and the time of the end, the pope was defrocked. So can the king of the north be the pope according to that history? It doesn't make any sense. And that's what we're hearing people say. The king of the north is the papacy. So we come to the point where he comes and puts his tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, and he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And at that time shall Michael stand up. Here is the beginning of the close of probation, when the king of the north sets up the tabernacles of, of, his, of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. We know very well. This is where in Jerusalem... They want to put their caliphate. That's what the Muslim world is doing and what Turkey is doing at this very present time. And I just want, just want to say that when I was teaching this before what was happening in Turkey now, Turkey looked like an insignificant nation. But now, is it significant in the world affairs right now? What is Turkey doing? What is President Erdogan doing? He is gathering all the Muslim states together and, he is, and he's got full control over Turkey as a, as a virtual dictator and he's got that position until, until uh, 2029. And his plan now is to get a summit of the Muslim world and establish armies of the Muslim world to... to re-establish the Ottoman Empire. And what they want to do is put their caliphate into Jerusalem. Just If you were to punch into your, uh, into your um, uh, internet caliphate, there you can read what their plan is, what the Muslim world is, to put their caliphate into Jerusalem. And that's what is written here. He shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. And when that happens, and, but he shall come to his end and none shall help him, when that happens, probation will close. Michael will stand up, finished with the, with the judgment hour. So we have emphasized here that it is Turkey and not the papacy can you detect whether it's possible that it could be the papacy? When does the papacy come to its end? And when does this king of the north come to his end? It says, he shall come to his end and none shall help him and at that time shall Michael stand up, probation will close. And there comes a time of trouble such as never was. So at that time... He will come to his end. 
when does the papacy come to its end? Let's go to the Bible in 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians, reading there from uh, chapter 2. And there we have the plain description of the papacy and when it comes to its end. Is that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not when I was with you. And he describes him there, and then he says, the mystery of iniquity does already work now, but he that letteth will until he be taken out of the way, verse 8, and then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with what? How will he come to his end? with the spirit of mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the king of the north comes to his end at the time when Jesus finishes his ministerial work, but the king of the papacy will come to his end at the brightness of his coming. A totally different scene. It cannot be the papacy, the king of the north. It's impossible. And let's let the spirit of prophecy in Great Controversy, page 578. Great Controversy, page 578. And there in uh, paragraph 3, the last half of that, um, Here it is, half, last half of that paragraph. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and the world wandered after the beast. The infliction of a deadly wound points to the downfall of the papacy in 1798. After this, says the prophet, his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. Paul states plainly that the man of sin will continue, what was that? Paul states plainly that the man of sin will continue until the second advent. To the very close of time, he will carry forward the work of deception. So there we have it, very simple. The papacy will continue until the close of time, not at the time when Jesus stands up at the very end when he comes. So Sister White further says in, in Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893, paragraph 12, the mystery of iniquity which had already begun to work in Paul's day will continue its work until it be taken out of the way at our Lord's second coming. So whoever teaches the symbolism that the king of the north is symbolic of the papacy they've, they've put symbolism into plain language they've added their interpretation this is the way the truth unfolds and for our salvation we need to know the event before Jesus comes in the clouds. We need to know the, the lead up, the looming of the close of probation so that we know what we need to learn to be sure that we will not be caught with what we read in Revelation 16 verse 15. Because when he comes to his end and none shall help him, the river Euphrates dries up. What did we read in Revelation 16 15? Behold, I come as a thief and you better be dressed. If we do not know the realities of what is transpiring before the close of probation, when probation closes, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth 
by those preachers and teachers who are not giving meat in due season. That's, Revela that's Matthew chapter 24, 25, 24, at the end of verse 24. The, the servant that says in his heart, my Lord delight is coming and eats and drinks with the drunken. The Lord will come upon him when he's not looking for him and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If we have the plain descriptions of Daniel chapter 11 before us, we can see what is happening in front of us and we know what we must do. What must we do? What does it say there in Revelation 16, 15? That you be not caught naked and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. What does it mean? What does Revelation chapter 3 verse 18 say? Revelation chapter 3, reading there verse 18. This is Jesus speaking. This is what we must do before probation closes, before he comes to his end and none shall help him. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with thyself that thou mayest see. This is the message for us at this present time as we see what Turkey, the king of the north, is doing. We need to do what? We need to buy of him white raiment that we will not be caught naked when he comes to his end and none shall help him. And this is what I want to do next week, to go into the depth of that, to conclude this series of three studies next week. What it means not to be caught naked when probation closes. May God help us to recognize what the Bible is saying without our private interpretation, just as it reads. We will be secure if we will do that. God bless us as we continue to meditate on this. Amen.